Welcome everyone to the Deep Dive, the podcast that skips small talk and goes straight for the concepts that shape our thinking and behavior. In this podcast, cold expertise is defenestrated as warm philosophy is enthroned in an attempt to explore the field in which we're all scientists looking for answers, living well. Hello world, welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive with Eyal Shai. Today I'm joined by Nick Winkleman. Hi Nick. Hi y'all, how are you? I'm doing mighty fine and happy to have you here. And without further ado, I'd like to hear from you. Um, what is the idea that carries you forward, that helps you live well and that you deal with both professionally and in your personal life? Well, I, I, I appreciate you providing a, a platform for me to share such an idea. And I'm uh, quite interested to see how, how you help me maybe understand it uh, a little bit differently today, as I've heard you do on other podcasts. So what is, what is my idea? Well, it's an, ever, it's an ever evolving one. And you always ask yourself how you come into contact for the first time by, by chance or choice with something, as I like to say, that, that seemingly wakes you up in the morning and keeps you up at night. And I certainly believe I've, I've found something like that. But before I, 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 name it, I name it outright, I'd like to give a little anecdote to help people access maybe what I access. And so if you know, they, they, they say that for many people presenting, giving, giving a speech, is, is scarier than death, that they would rather be the person uh, for which the eulogy is about than the one giving the eulogy. Now, obviously, <laughs> I think if it came down to it, no one would actually choose that, but it points to the fact that communicating, presenting, and, and sharing your ideas, especially to many, many people, is a pretty scary proposition. And I share that because I think deeply inside of that is our desire, our, our need to be understood, that we have this deep-seated fear that the way we see and understand ourselves in the world and therefore communicate it outwardly to the world will not be understood, as if there was only two of us and I only knew Russian or English, and, and you only knew Spanish or, or, or Japanese, that we literally could not communicate with one another. I, I believe this is a fear in, inside of all of us, and it probably stems back to us being social creatures and depending on our ability to connect and understand one another in the same way to allow us to work together and move forward. I, I believe a lot of this probably tracks back to that. And so I've always found then that space between two humans where we try to create something that is different or bigger than both of us. This thing that I usually call shared meaning. I try to get an idea out of my head, offer it up to yours, and yet with different experiences, even though we might be using the same language, we have to come to understand or attempt to understand this thing in the same way. And so that is a grounding at the most philosophical basic level of what I'm interested in. Now, the context or the canvas that that comes to life is funny enough in sport. So I am a strength coach. I help people get bigger, faster, stronger. I help them develop themselves athletically. And, and I've always done that, fortunately for me, in kind of professional sporting contexts. American football, now professional rugby, but I've also worked with general population and military and kind of everybody in between. And so I see myself more than a strength coach as a movement professional. And what I'm interested in is how people learn to move and how they use their body as a means to achieve goals, to achieve purpose, uh, and just to achieve overall well-being. Now, to do that, though, to help people, let's say, maximize the way they express and access and use movement, 
I need to be able to help take them on a journey from where they are to where they want to be. And as a coach, right, and, and, and I use the term coach in the broadest sense, as someone who takes a person from where they are and guides them to where they want to be, I am meant to see something that the athlete, in my case, cannot see or feel themselves. And it is my responsibility to help give them vision, to help guide them on a path, to know, hey, maybe left is better than right here, or hey, you're about to step off the edge, let me offer something that gets you back on track. Let me be very clear though, the athlete in my world, and this is true of all humans in any endeavor, they have to be the one that takes the step. It is never me. And so I use the word guide quite a bit because that's the best case. I can offer you something. It ultimately comes down to whether or not you want to accept and use it. Now, for anyone listening, I'm sure they've had teachers, coaches, people that have helped them achieve and gain skills of any variety. That's what I do. And what we know is while there's many ways to do that, you know, like we can learn through experience, trial and error. Um, you know, when you're trying to teach someone how to ride a bike, usually the bike will do a lot of the teaching, right? The bike, mm -hmm. you and gravity tend to work out pretty well to figure out how to ride this thing. It doesn't take a lot of coaching. It doesn't take a lot of verbal coaching. And so for me, what I have found to be interesting and a gap in my own practice and a, and a gap in my industry at large, and many would say just in humanity at large, is my ability to verbally communicate movement. So literally, I'll say it again, communicate movement in a form of a language. Because think about this. Movement is a felt activity. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can ask you to watch someone run, y'all, and say, hey, describe the running. But your words are not the same exact thing as the felt sense and first person experience of the person running. And so there's this interesting challenge as a coach that if I'm trying to teach you to do anything, let's say running, for example, I'm offering you something that comes in the form of sound waves that then you digest and compute as, as thought, as words, as outer dialogue turned inward. But then somehow, those words need to turn into a signal, a felt sense, a physical signal that you can act out into the world, which is not a verbal endeavor. It is a physical one. It's an implicit one. It's one that is far more complex than one could ever put into the spoken word. But right. yet coaches, y'all do it every day. They offer up words and those words are turned into actions. And those in some cases, are lasting, learned actions, but in many cases, they're not, right? They're fleeting. They improve the athlete for a moment, but they don't stick or they don't improve them at all. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately what this comes down to is I am interested in the intersection between what a person, what a coach says, and the impact it has on an athlete's ability to understand and apply it to the physical movement. And what we come to realize, and, and then I'll, I'll offer it back to you, is while there are not rules on how to do this, black and white rules, there are our principles, principles of how we are wired to communicate, understand, and apply things to movement. And once we understand these principles, we can systematically offer up or co-create language that is easily turned into a perception, a way to see the world differently, that in doing so allows you to feel and act in the world differently, which nets out to better movement, better performance, and in my world, lends itself to winning sporting matches. So that's, that's at a thousand and probably a hundred foot view what, uh, what, my, what my passion project is. Yeah, that's beautiful. And already right off the bat, it's it's very clear that uh, you're as agile with words as you are with uh, with training. Um, yeah, this is wonderful. And, you know, just uh, we chatted a little bit before hitting record here. And uh, so, you know, that I do dialectic with people, which is concerned, again, with establishing uh, communication between two people and uh, making it as 
customized as possible to the person you're talking with, right? Because running is something that we all know um, it's kind of a word that just goes around and we know what it means, sort of. But when it comes to each and every one of us, we have our own set of experiences and, you know, even our, do, do we like running? Do we not like running? This could actually, um, this matters when somebody tells us uh, to run if we don't like, and they don't know whether we like it or not. This might be not as good as, as giving us a different command. And I hope we'll, we'll get to that. But to say this about um, dialectic and communication, I really love this um, understanding that, you know, each conversation is a new puzzle to be solved, right? Each conversation needs to be um, completely made anew and not just trust that the other person exactly understand what you mean or how you mean it and so on. And this is exactly what I love about your, uh, your thought and work. And I want to start at the beginning and kind of understand from you maybe what is the origin story of that with you uh, personally? Like what, what, when have you become uh, more interested in that with your life and starting to think about it? Uh, because I know a lot of coaches um, that whose attitude is to just speak in those uh, regular everyday terms of like, you know, straighten your shoulders, uh, you know, rest, rest your body, whatever it is, and just assuming that the person is going to have this felt sense when it is, it is hard, like you say. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that's perfect. So for me, um, I've, albeit someone who probably tilts towards gaining energy from introversion, I've always had strong uh, extroverted tendencies, at least in terms of how I, I act in the world. So I've always been a very, a very verbal person. I, I don't, I can work things out for myself in all aspects of life through my inner dialogue, but it only becomes real once I externalize it. And that's just how I, I've been wired and, and something that I try to, to work on in my uh, balance of, of what I need to say and, and what I can process. So, I, so language and the ability to use it to be understood or rather to understand myself, my mom could tell you is something that's always been part of, of my, my tilt. Um, and so it's not really then surprising for me that I got into something that's centered around our use of language. Because um, when you feel that it's something compelled, that compels you, you, you want to, at least in my case, want to understand it as, as, as strongly as you can. And so my first then observation of the interaction between language and movement, like even though it's, if you've ever been coached, it's always there, but you're not always aware of the connection between how much what that person is saying or in fact, what you're saying and the impact it has on, on others in terms of shaping the inner dialogue. And so I was, I was a young aspiring coach, I wasn't even a coach yet. And I was working with a fellow personal trainer and he just works with general population clients, some amateur bodybuilders. And he's a very charismatic fellow. And, you know, he, I, I would say by most conventional wisdom, he had a pretty healthy appreciation for his own skills. Some might call it ego. <laughs> I'm right there wrongly. So he, but he enjoyed what he did, y'all. He, he enjoyed what he did. And for that, I really liked being around him. And so what, what I found interesting is he was very purposeful with his language. Whether or not he knew this, I, I don't know. I suspect not, but he was very purposeful with his language. And he would always make sure right before the client performed an exercise of any type, could be a bicep curl or bench press, that he would give them one thing to think about, one really clear idea. And he'd be very charismatic, very purposeful, very animated, even with his nonverbals and how he communicated the cue. And I just remember after watching him for months on end, knowing he was doing something different, but not quite sure what it was, it finally hit me that that was it. It was the way he taught, how he taught more than what he taught. 
And that that stuck with me. Now, I, I probably didn't do much with that idea until another six, seven years later. But then six, seven years later, I was a, a coach. I was running a program, working with aspiring NFL athletes, American football athletes. And I, I had this moment. Now, it, it's an overused word, but it's how it felt. I had this kind of moment of professional awakening where I realized I had 10 athletes in front of me and we're just going through movement activities that are meant to help with running and sprinting. And I was just monologuing, right? Ironically, considering this conversation is around dialectic, I was monologuing. And I was just saying, as you said earlier, you know, get tall, knees up, push the ground away. And I was just throwing out all of these coaching cues offering up all these coaching cues, like I was reading them off a Wikipedia page, right? There was no, <laughs> there was rationale behind each of the coaching cues. Cause I would see athlete A was doing one thing wrong. Athlete B was doing something else, athlete C, but I was just offering them up in a freestyle type approach. And really what it amounted to y'all is I wasn't creating a space for dialogue. I wasn't creating a space in my own head to confirm whether or not that dialogue was understood, applied, and as you say, action correctly. So I wasn't creating any feedback loops for my own self to understand whether or not my coaching was making an impact. I wasn't creating space for them to offer back and express their understanding of the meaning of what I was saying. There was both operational reasons for that, meaning when I was talking and how I designed the session, but also there was no rhyme or reason to what I was offering in terms of the actual words themselves. But the thing is, I could have had any elite strength coach in the world watch me coach, and they wouldn't have said boo, because I was running a well-timed session, good order of drills, what I was saying biomechanically made sense. I was doing it in a strong, convicted voice. My beard looked good, you know, and I was, I was the part. But I was failing myself and I was failing my athletes. And so I remember that year, it was around 2009 when that first hit me, I, I had this incredible anxiety, not anxiety in a negative sense, but this anxiety that said, hey, you've, a blind spot has revealed itself to you. What are you going to do with this? And so I, I, I went to work and inevitably what I realized was, to move is to, is, is to feel, is to experience the world. And I don't mean this flippantly. It's to dance with the world around you. You know, our, our movements are designed to solve problems the world has presented us with. The, the, the movement that we call the swimming stroke solves the problem of moving through water. The movement that we call climbing solves the problem of getting higher in a tree to, to get to fruit or to get to honey, right? The movement of running, right? Jogging or walking is to efficiently move us over varying distances at different speeds. The way I do it though is very different than how let's say a cheetah does it because our biology, our biomechanical constraints are not the same. And so movement ultimately comes back to engaging with the world around you to solve a problem as efficiently as you can with the physical hardware you have available to you. Now, I, I start there because that tells us that in terms of the phenomenology, the experience of the person, we have to inevitably get them back to first person, externally focused, right? When I go to pick up a glass of water, I see the water, and based on the shape of the vessel holding the water, my hand will change shape. How I hold a pint glass of varying thicknesses determines how big my hand opens. If I grab a coffee cup, I use a different position, right? If I have a glass of whiskey and a tumbler, I have a different position still. And so my body quite literally morphs itself, shapes itself to that world around me. And so the more inward I am, the more I'm thinking about where should my hand or elbow be, 
the more I retreat from the reality I'm meant to engage or dance with. Mm. So movement unavoidably is always existing in the space between perceiver and perceived, between person and context. And so as a coach who wants to improve that dance, as a coach who wants to improve that relationship, I need to first respect that that relationship exists before me. And that just as I can influence that for the better, I can equally interrupt it. We've all heard of things like paralysis by analysis, right? overthinking, or I wasn't thinking, right? We could give all of these euphemisms that explain what happens when brain, body, and environment are disconnected, are not, if you will, communicating effectively. So in many ways, I'm a movement therapist, and I'm a relationship counselor. The relationship, though, is your body and the environment. These are the two parties that are trying to communicate physically better. And so I'm trying to offer something up into that space that gives you renewed perspective. In a manner of speaking, I do dialectic, right, in the manner of how people engage and move in the world around them. And so a few more offerings here, then I'll pause. What that then tells me as a coach is, okay, I have to inevitably get them external. I have to get them focusing richly and in the right way on the person in front of me. They have to listen. They have to learn to listen with their body in both how they understand their body's response to the movement and the world they're moving in. And so immediately then I can offer you up two different coaching cues for sprinting as the example. Coaching cue number one is, hey, I need you to extend your knee. Coaching cue number two, which actually principally biomechanically means the same thing, I need you to push the ground away. Now, in one case, the latter of the two push the ground away. I'm offering up a perspective that embeds you and connects you to the environment you're moving in. In the other one, I ask you to retreat one step away from that, away from the bot, away from the environment. I disconnect you from the, the task itself and ask you to consider one part of your body that is only one part of the process of sprinting. Now, to get to a little bit of a punchline here, people in strength conditioning, physiotherapy, and sport coaching inadvertently are guilty of using a lot of body-oriented language, which makes sense intuitively that if you're trying to, to, to improve the body, that a lot of what you would say is about the body. But unfortunately, when I start to talk about where your shoulder is, where your elbow is, where your mm -hmm. knee is, we lose sight of the ultimate goal, the ultimate relationship. And so at present, there are 24 years of empirical evidence that does nothing more than to echo one's own intuition if they know how to examine it, that says that when you offer up language meant to change focus, perception, the way we see the world and the way we feel our body in the world, that when our language is externalized, push the ground away versus internalized, extend your knee, we tend to see with great consistency and repeatability, better performance in the moment, performance measured by quality of movement, speed of movement in the case of sprinting, better retention, which means y'all, they learn. They hold on to the change. Ah, mm -hmm. the communication resulted in actual tangible growth. And that that change seems to be independent of skill level, of gender, skill, skill type, ability, or expert level. That this is a, a unifying principle of the way we interact with the world. And again, it's odd that we need a research to tell us to move in the world, we need to know how to focus on the world. <laughs> it is odd we needed 24 years of research to, to argue that point, but here we are. And so my craft now is what we just explained there is a ticket to the start line. Once people come back into contact with that reality, the next question that you usually ask is, well, how do I do this? 
How do I come up with external cues or analogies, analogical figurative language that promotes uh, an external focus, such as, hey, when you're sprinting, gradually rise like a jet taking off. Yes, there's no actual jet taking off, but I can act as if I am a jet taking off, right. which is still, it is still as far as motor learning is concerned, externalizing the mind because mm-hmm. I'm not placing it on the body. And so what, when, I, when, I, when I learn to do this, I have an infinite well of communication strategies to convey movement that you can digest in a first person friendly manner that allows you to feel and engage the world differently and for the better. And so that's, that's how it started and that's where it is. Yeah, I love it. And you know, go- going back to what to what you said, I can't remember the exact words, but understanding that you need to um, to uh, to be external before you just go on and think about something. Um, this is to me. I don't know if you if you even noticed or thought about it, but at the beginning you said, "Well, I realized that I was looking the part." So in essence, if all you cared about was yourself and how it's viewed from the outside, you're, you're in the clear, right? That's what you said. And, there, and still, there was an inner dissatisfaction with where things are because you didn't see the impact you wanted to make on the outside. And that yeah. is in itself an embodiment of this approach that must sit um, from the beginning in your own psyche. And I have a theory about life, and that is, you know, that maybe it's just the the culture we're in, but we're just pushed so hard as if the best thing in the world is to feel that you are doing well. And just from talking to a lot of people, I recognize that, no, I, I strongly believe that the greatest way of being is to actually noticing uh, change in others, seeing others blossom, and then helping them go through that, that is far more satisfying than catching yourself in some uh, moment and saying, oh, here I feel good. Because actually living well is an activity. It's not, it's not having stuff. It's not a, a slice of time. It's a prolonged uh, activity that is designed to harmonize things around you And the things that we most likely are to feel strongly about when they're harmonized, they're other people and the relationship we have with them. So I think it's it's very clear from the beginning that you have this um, understanding for yourself that really what you're out there on the pitch for is not so much uh, be a a spectator of, of your own greatness as it's perceived by others, but actually seeing other people doing well and this brings in the the more lasting satisfaction because this can be repeated day in and day out and i absolutely love that as well as the part about talking um, on how to actually connect people to their surroundings or to other people i imagine if it's team sports or if it's relationships then always make sure that we are not the end or the the be all end all of of things, right? Things in the world does not stop with me here or the little sphere of influence that I have, Uh, but they go on and I have an effect on other people which then have an effect uh, back on me. And we should be using the the relational language that uh, reminds this uh, to us consistently. And this is what I really appreciate about, uh, and I have heard this before from you talking about the external cues. And I'm trying to bring it around to like kind of touch on on what I do and what I'm interested in. Then, yeah, with dialectic, you know, dealing with the concepts that we use and seeing how they really can be true and sit well with reality so that we may flow better then again, of course, it's unsurprising almost at this point that the metaphors we use for uh, doing well is one of flow, right? It is movement, it is, it has to do with body, it has to do with physics. We all know this feeling. And I'm wondering 
for myself, like where it could come in for me and my work at con uh, consistently giving cues for people so that they build concepts be because these concepts, uh, figuring out how to make uh, a discrepancy or inconsistency go away in your thinking is in a very real way like removing a wall, an invisible wall that you up until now were constantly be um, butting your head against at any time yeah. you're, you're going forward. And yeah, this is, this is, this is the thing that I, I most wanted to talk with you about is like how these things could be taken out of the realm of, of sports because sport is, can be a great metaphor for life but it only extends so far. So when we go to a thing like uh, prizes, well, in sports, we have them, right? The word athlete literally means somebody competing from a prize in Greek. Yes. And yes. we are not competing for a, for a prize. And this is what most interested me for me is to see how we move this um, use of external cues of thinking to stuff uh, that, that is outside the realm of sports and just life at large. And I, I really wanted to hear your thoughts about it and, and maybe even share experiences that you had with it. Yeah, I, so you obviously have a sense of, of the depth of this, as we rightly said, that that's kind of what connected us. And I meet, I've been fortunate to meet other individuals that, that seem to have your same interest y'all in that they they don't necessarily work in sport they see the metaphor of sport but then they come into contact with some of these ideas that we're talking about right now and because communication and seeking to be understood and seeking to see your impact i like to use the word echo beyond you beyond the walls of who you are in others right? i think this is something that, that well transcends just sport itself and i'll be completely honest to you and your audience this question you are asking me is one that that timed up with COVID. I, I've been looking at deeper than anything else in myself. You know, knowing that what sits as I opened up with, what sits behind my interest in this area is far deeper than just coaching cues and getting people to, to, to run better. It, it is ultimately about learning to connect better with yourself through understanding how you can connect with others. Uh, and, and that for me is, is a remarkably meaningful endeavor. Um, fortunately, when I, when I published my book on this topic, The Language of Coaching in 2020, I had, as many people, I had a stack of books I was so excited to finally read and engage with after the, the book was published. So I could go back to being a student versus you know the, the proverbial you know, professorial role uh, in, in writing a book that's meant to impact an industry. And so... And this is where Rafe and I have, have a lot of commonalities. And, and for your audience's familiarity, you know, engaging with the, the concepts of, of Jordan Peterson and John Verveke and, and, and others, really looking at how meaning shows up in your life, how, how you can live in a more consistent state of flow, but uh, remove yourself from the attachment that, will, that, that things will always be in flow. And that things will always be easy and allow yourself to, you know, ride the, the, the bumps and, and, and the peak moments as, as, as well as you do the valleys and the low moments. And it's still a work in progress, probably for most throughout their whole life. But I found myself continually drawn, and I am going to circle back to your question, drawn to the teachings of, of Zen Buddhism and reading more in, in Taoism alongside of, you know, the, the, the Stoic insights, which are, are, are certainly far more ever present now with Ryan Holiday and others, making them contemporary once again, to revisiting uh, more recent uh, philosophers who utilized those teachings. So Alan Watts, most notably, would be someone who I've, I've studied as well. And in all cases, y'all, in all cases, what it keeps coming back to, and this is even true of Csikszentmihalyi and the flow research itself, is we tend to achieve this state of wholeness, of oneness, 
of, of flow that obviously as Eckhart Tolle and others talk about is, is utter presence in the now. Um, we do this when we are fully and utterly invested in which is another way to say fully invested in the dance between us and our surroundings. And even though we are always unavoidably in a context in our surroundings, as I am in this chair in front of this computer, we are not always there with presence of mind. And for me, what I have found is the more we retreat inward, y'all, the more we retreat into the theorizing of anything, ourselves, a situation, a memory, a possible future, the more risk we are of, call it unhappiness or anxiety or dissatis dissatisfied. And I believe in a manner of speaking that is a bit of our inner working saying, no, no, all you have is the now. All you have is the present moment. Why are you retreating from it? I've never actually verbalized it that way, but that in, in a manner of speaking where makes a bit of sense that our body's natural response to us retreating from reality would be to give us an emotional milieu that says to go back, you're doing it wrong. You're running the wrong way. You're running away from the present moment versus being fully invested in it. And this is why for me studying uh, Zen, and, and, I, and I don't want that to sound overly pretentious, um, but in trying to understand Zen itself has been one of the more useful exercises for my coaching, my relationships, and my own mental health, uh, which COVID has challenged everybody in that space. And so a story here. I was over in Japan with Irish rugby for the World Cup in 2019. And I've always been drawn to Japan. I've been there a number of times. I could live there. Culturally, I just find it endlessly fascinating. And we were fortunate enough to go to a, a Zen Buddhist temple and meet with the, uh, the, 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 the Zen master of this temple. And one of the individuals in my party asked the question, what is Zen and what does the West, as he put it, get wrong in our understanding of it? And the, the, the gentleman paused and he was working with a translator and he said what sounded like two words. But what was translated back to us is Zen is emptiness. Now, to someone unfamiliar with that as a practice, I think the word emptiness, the, the not having of something or the loss of something would be considered to be a negative. But I knew just enough at the time of hearing him say this, where it gave me chills and I felt this inner, this inner joy. Because my understanding, and I believe this is fairly accurate in terms of what is meant by the word emptiness, is it's not a matter of not having, but rather emptying, as in emptying a glass, pouring outward all that you have all that you are into the world around you. Emptying oneself to be fully present in the given moment, which is definable as flow, mm -hmm. loss in what you are doing. And his second point was that many in the West equate Zen with Zazen, which is sitting Zen, meaning that Zen is meditation. And no, meditation in his words, and I've since read plenty to, to, to validate this, not that it needed validation, is that meditation is training the character of the mind to be able to come back to reality, to be able to step back into the world of acting versus theorizing, the world of being versus having. And for that, it is a very useful tool to train the mind to not distract itself with empty wants and desires and what ifs and could be's and cherish all that we ever have. And this was clearly put very artistically by Alan Watts 
in the ever present now. That's all there ever was and ever will be. And so a lot of people hear that and it sounds like now, you know, an Instagram reel or a bumper sticker. And it is, it's useful for both of those. But for me, it, it is also the, the greatest source of, uh, of strength and happiness. And I'm a leader of my life, uh, albeit not devoting myself to a temple, but the practice of these temples uh, engage in and embody of trying to get present at being here and now. And so to bring that back, that is very much so an external focus. That is very much so learning how to dance better with my present circumstances and, and my environment. It's knowing that I feel better when I can reflect on a day and feel like I haven't thought about a whole lot because I was utterly lost in acting, in doing, in becoming. And so uh, y'all, I think there's plenty of runway and that is a concept that for me utterly mirrors perfectly what I do in the professional sector. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense and brings so many, so many thoughts to to my head. I'll just, I'll just finish with the one you just landed on uh, now, which I feel like is um, the the whole thought of of really being in the moment and being zen. And then I, for myself, set a, a criterion which I think is is unusual. Uh, most people, I think, in our culture, at least in the West, are very much looking around them to see what outcomes their um, <clears throat> their actions have ended up in and and judging how well they did by that or what's coming ahead are good things have good things come have bad things come and for me the moment i started kind of having the habit of just let's say take a uh, take a look back in time and it can be a week it can be a month it can be a year if you see yourself actually saying, you know what? All I can remember was that something inside of me emotionally is telling me that I haven't had much um, internal strife or something like that. That's all I want to do. It really then does not really matter if I gained more reputation, if I made more money, all these things are completely secondary to the, to the fact that I can look back and realize that, you know, I haven't been plagued by internal strife. I wasn't fighting myself. I wasn't fighting with others, hopefully. And I think we're not used to be looking back and seeing how well we're doing now by looking back. We always tend to look forward and try to foresee both the good and the bad and like you say, be so much um, like thinking about it and how we're going to bring about this desired outcome. And I think that it's it's something that uh, I talked before with my friend Nico on this podcast. But the the move the the special moment that where the well where all the theory is is put in some compartment, okay, now it's it's time to act. And this is what the cues do. And this is what is fascinating to me. I just yesterday uh, watched Free Solo for the first time. I imagine that you watched it. Um, Alex Honnold is, is an amazing uh, athlete and interesting person. And you can see when he set out to do the Free Solo of El Capitan, um, there was a lot of theory in it right in the form of every move is actually documented is in his notebook and he knows how to do it and he's done it many times with with rope and so on but there comes the day when he uh when he lets go of the rope and has to and has to just uh do it and I don't know what the cue is for him. Actually, it's very mysterious because he just, you know, finishes one day and then towards the night is like, okay, tomorrow is the day. And this is the cue for him. And I imagine that for him to lose the rope is really the ultimate kind of cue to start acting in this perfectly um, exact way, right? The, because he literally can't do the, the wrong move anymore. So there is a lot of practice, but the jumping into the moment and being empty there and emptying yourself into the world, this is something that is infinitely uh, fascinating for me. And 
something that we, I think, our culture lacks very much because we're, we're, like you say, there is so much thinking about the future. And then as soon as we are there, we're already thinking about the next thing and the next thing. And I don't know, have you, do you have any sort of, or, or you've come across any satisfactory um, description of, of what is going on in, in that moment that actually makes us kind of turn on the switch and just go for it? So it, it's interesting. I'll, I'll come at this maybe from a few different, a few different directions. Um, I, no, I, I don't have a simple satisfactory reason. I, I think like meditation, as a coach, I'm trying to help develop the character of the mind that allows you to consistently be present in your performance of whatever the physical endeavor you've voluntarily said is the, is the one that um, feeds your soul. And so in a manner of speaking, you know, it is very meditative. You know, meditation is not any one thing. Uh, meditation is a characteristic of how we use our attention at the end of the day. And I, I see myself and, and, what, and what an athlete does and what we do as humans in every moment is we place a bet on where best to place our attention to get the most out of or contribute the most into whatever it is we're doing. Every moment we make a choice, knowingly or not, to place our attention on one thing at the expense of an infinite grouping of others. That's what, that's what life is. It's an, it's an infinite set of attentional choices. Yes. And, and you know, we say we are what we eat. Well, even more so than that, we are what we pay attention to. And, and, and many individuals far greater than me have said that in many different ways. And I believe that fully. And so to try to understand the character of your attention, the character of your attentional choices is to point at um, a solution to all in a, in a manner of speaking. So a couple of different things for me. One is asking what causes people to retreat? What causes people to retreat into their mind and overthink when they're in a sporting activity? What causes people to retreat away from the now and to start thinking about the could have been, so the past or the what could be, the future, and in all cases tend to betray the present moment, which for extended periods of time ultimately lead, I feel, to unhappiness in a dissatisfied life. And so I think part of the challenge is we are, and I believe I'm on solid ground saying this generally, biologically, we are wired to retreat first and progress second. Meaning when we would hear the rustling in the bush, the first thing we would do is we'd step back, we'd step away. Or if we saw a, a lion or a predator coming towards us, we would move away very rapidly. And so biologically speaking, from a survival perspective, it would make sense that your first move is to step back, is to retreat. In a modern context, y'all, I don't. We, we still have predators, but they're, they're less environmental predators that can actually take our life. But they're more self-imposed, cultural, mental, societal predators, status, uh, money, love, right, and what have you. These social psychological concepts. So that we're still wired in that case to to retreat and try to utterly maximize the odds that we will be successful, utterly maximize the odds that we are happy. But the problem is when we try to become overly predictive, we, we try to get in and think about all possible futures, challenging ourselves to do all the things that we need to to maximize the best possible future, what we realize is the future is not yes here, the past is gone, all we have is the now. And if we continue to engage in this behavior, we will only continue to be unhappy because we betray the only thing that actually is real, which is the present moment. Now, this is very much so an Alan Watts type concept. 
He's like, what makes you think that if you sit here right now thinking about all the things you should do to get the most out of the future, when you finally get there, you will not continue to be doing the same thing about the next right. possible future. Right. And I'm like, absolutely. He's a hundred percent right. I've seen it in myself. I see it in others. And even with that knowledge, it's still not enough to stop you from doing it. And so uh, in the, in, 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 in Alan Watts's book on, on ignorance and, and basically an, an uncertainty, he has a number of useful thought experiments, if I can use that. And he says the following. He says, when you try to hold your breath, when you try to hold your breath, you inevitably lose it. You lose your life. He also says, a knife cannot cut itself, nor can a fire burn itself. And so what, this, what we start to realize is when we try to control our future, we try to hold our breath, ultimately it betrays the reason we held the breath and the purpose, and, and the purpose of it, because we, we lose it. And the question is, well, what would lead us to hold our breath in the first place? What would lead us to try to take actions that maximize or give us as much certainty as possible in this life we want to live. Well, that is because we fear the opposite. We fear the pain. We fear it not going the way we want it to. But his point is, what if we remove that fear? And we remove that fear by becoming it, by stepping fully into it. And so this harkens back to the knife cannot cut itself, the fire cannot burn itself. When you become or allow yourself to become, which is oftentimes in nothing more than your own thoughts, the thing you face is to have the capacity to harm you. When you make the active decision to sit in the painful emotion, when you take the active decision to sit in the painful thought, it relieves its hold on you tremendously but it's not easy to do it's very difficult to do but i'll, I'll give an example if, if you know you only do this to yourself if you know I, I usually use a fork if you if you take a fork and you just press it into your skin enough where you, you feel a little bit of discomfort and you go through this mental thought process of allowing yourself to fully become the sense of the fork on your skin. You allow yourself to be 100 invested in the pain versus you try to run away from it. You try to stop thinking about that fork and you notice the difference in the experience. It is far more painful to run away from it, mentally speaking, than to sit and stay within it. If you sit and stay within it, it somehow starts to lose its hold over you. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not encouraging any kind of self-harm here by any stretch, but, it, but it's, a, it's a matter of a useful physical way to engage with these concepts and to play around with them for yourself. And so these are, I, I don't even remember the initial prompt of the question, but these are some of the various ideas I'm toying, away, toying around with, not by any sense of perfection at all, but in a manner to try to recognize why do we retreat? so often? Why do we retreat when we're in sport? Why do we retreat when we're on stage and we're nervous? Why do we retreat in life when things get hard versus staying utterly present and with it and in it? That's what I'm thinking about. And, and these are some of my current thoughts about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it fits perfectly because I think that a lot of times in life, again, if we look at sports, it's quite, it's quite clear when the whistle goes off and, and, and you're off to the races, right? You're off to, to pass the ball and so on. That's easy because it kind of gives you a, a very clear prompt of where you should start to perform, even though, as you say, sometimes in, in certain cases, even then you can be like completely off and not be in it. But in life itself, it's like, what is easier than not recognizing the next best thing to do now, not realizing you're in something? And we are. We're always in an activity. Uh, we can choose to be relatively inactive, but like you say, torturing ourselves in our own mind is a type of activity. It is. So it I is. think we have to recognize something, like if I were to do this uh, metaphorically, 
I will tell you, see this door, go up to this door, open this door. After Once you pass through the door, you do not go consult your no notebook. So no notebooks about how this activity should be done, right? You just do everything that you know. And the mountain of, of theory that you have be behind you is going to help you, right? But not in that moment. You're not going to consult and find the correct action by looking back at the, at the guy that you left at home. And I think that because in life there are no doors, it's just this continual activity. It could be very easy to just uh, not realize that we are in something. And maybe this is because that we used to be a lot more alert, you know, in our beginnings as, as people in the savannah, we had to be alert. It, it felt more like an activity because stress levels would, were higher or something like that. Today, we have a lot of time for rumination and it might throw us off this mode of actually performing when eventually what is good for us is to at every moment see if we can make something better around us, whether it's, whether it's our surrounding to beautify it and especially if it's, if it's a loved one to care for, or just a stranger that we could spark conversation with. And I think that is something that, um, that, uh, comes up to my mind when I when I uh, think about these things. Um, yeah, so I know uh, we have a we have a, a hard stop today, and I don't want to push up all the way against it. And uh, yeah, Nick, to 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 end things with, uh, first of all, if you have any uh, last comments, we still have a little bit of time, I believe. And then also, I would love for you to to share with listeners uh, where your thoughts can be found, where your book can be found, and uh, maybe what you're working on today, and where do you think it's yeah. going to lead you? Well, y'all, thank you again for for inviting me on. I, I think there's plenty of runway in this conversation, so so maybe maybe we can now uh, we can, there can be a part two to this yes. in the future. Um, in terms of where my thoughts can be found, I, I love how you put that. So I, I'm on the various channels. Sometimes I'm very active, sometimes I'm not. So I, I don't wanna promise any, any consistent flow of content, but it's, it's at Nick Winkleman uh, on Instagram and, and Twitter. Uh, the book, for those that find it interesting, even just generally conceptually, let alone specifically to the, to the topic matter, it's the language of coaching. The Art and Science of Teaching Movement, and probably Amazon is the best place to get that, or Human Kinetics, the publisher. In terms of my, my next set of projects, um, they all will continue to center around this space. And so I, I will be producing, call it more movement or sports-specific versions of the language of coaching moving forward. But the project I'm really excited about, y'all, is... Uh, a fictional book that I'm that I'm working on right now that will tackle uh, that will tackle these topics. It will definitely tackle learning. It will tackle life, but it will uh, broaden the application of what we've talked about here to to the human condition as much as the learning as a human, uh, how to condition yourself to move better. And I'm going to do that through through a fictional through a fictional lens. Uh, I've I've done it through book chapters and some other short stories. The feedback has been, wow, it is far more profound to digest these concepts through a fictional medium that interestingly enough, portrays everything in action, right? It portrays the concepts in the living of them versus the theorizing of them, mm -hmm. which your comments earlier have now just reminded and sparked why uh, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about bringing them to life in a fictional format. And so, so that's probably the thing I'm, I'm most excited uh, about doing. And, and I think um, in terms of any parting, parting thoughts to, to the audience, and this is probably as much to, to myself as, you know, we are always, I, I, I like it, we're always embedded in an activity. We are always embedded in a process. And the one reflection I've had of late is, Sometimes we feel we are always the one that has to be doing something, searching for something. But sometimes the best place to be is in the now in allowing yourself to sit with what is happening to you and within you. And once we stop fighting it, we can learn from it. And, and this is something that, uh, especially when it comes to painful things, has been a very powerful thought for me. I've sampled its benefit, but still a work in progress. 
Beautiful, beautiful, Nick. And uh, you said part two, and I say yes, anytime. Uh, so we'll make it happen. And this has been uh, an amazing pleasure. And until next time, thank you. Until next time, thank you so much.